Hello ladies and gentlemen, good to see you again. This is the third laboratory for the third week uh, and it's partnered with the third lecture which I carried out on descriptive statistics. Um, so today we're going to be spinning up our studio and we're going to be uh, carrying out um, uh, some assessment of different metrics um, specifically relating to descriptive statistics. And uh, you'll remember from the previous lecture, which I hope you've now watched, um, that there are essentially uh, three different ways in which we can summarise a data set, as you can see here. Uh, so essentially we're able to describe data based on um, measures of central tendency, so single values such as the mode or the median or the mean. We're then able to uh, describe data sets based on uh, the spread of data. Um, <clears throat> so this could be the level of variance or the standard, uh, the standard deviation or the coefficient of, uh, of variation. Uh, and then finally, we have uh, the, the actual shape that that distribution could be. So this uh, is uh, dependent on um, how skewed the, the distribution is or the degree of kurtosis, which uh, the, the, the distribution of the data actually displays. And um, we're going to be going through these three different areas within the R code. So I hope you're all able to uh, download the R code off the, uh, the Blackboard website. And here we have it. So this is the, the second lab. I'm sorry, so we didn't do a lab in the first week. So this is the second lab. And uh, make sure you download the code now and you put it into uh, a local folder uh, on your desktop. Um, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm assuming everything now is, is up and running given that you've submitted the first assignment. Uh, what we need to do in this uh, in this first session is basically to load in the inbuilt data set on uh, Old Faithful. So let's have a look at what that is. So here I'm just loading it and basically printing the data straight to the console. But the question is, well, what does that data actually represent? As you can see here, uh, this data set is for the Old Faithful uh, Giza, which is in uh, Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming. So I don't know if many of you are familiar with this. So in the um, log book, in a day um, uh, here's a video which I found online, which you know you can Google if you're not sure uh, or what it is. But essentially, um, uh, all of the data represent uh, how frequent uh, the actual geyser uh, erupts, and this water spouts out through this this hole. Um, and they are also interested in measuring things like the height of, of this particular physical phenomenon. Um, and uh, if you look here at this, uh, at this video, then it will give you a bit more background information, uh, which might help uh, you understand uh, specifically what we're going to be working with here. Okay, and there's two variables to that one data set. So actually, if I just make this a data set, so data frame equals faithful, and I put that into our global environment here like this. Rather than printing it to the console down here, now we can actually just view it within the global environment. So we have these two different uh, columns. The first one is um, uh, uh, labeled eruptions. It's numeric and it's the eruption time in minutes. So it's how long um, the actual water um, was pumped out of uh, the, the actual geyser um, as a result of physical action. And then number two, the second metric here, which we have in the, the right-hand column, is also numeric, and it's the waiting time. So it's the uh, time uh, to the next eruption from the previous one in minutes. Both of these are in minutes. So if you need to take more time to inspect that data, then just type health faithful, help faithful, and you'll be able to look at the inbuilt data set here. So in the lecture, we spoke about the mode how we calculate the mode. So the mode obviously is the, the most frequently occurring value. Um, so there isn't an inbuilt function within R which presents the mode. Um, so here we're going to begin with some manual ways in order to um, uh, inspect this specific data. Um, so we're interested in the most frequently available. Here we've just used the sort function essentially to print all of the data values to the console and then you're able to go and have a look at um, uh, which you think might be the most frequently occurring. Uh, 
yeah, I don't really use these manual approaches and I wouldn't advise you to, but it's, it's a good place for us to start now. And, and I'm going to show you how to actually automate uh, that process um, or at least generate some ways for you to easily identify what the mode may be. So rather than just looking at these pure numbers, why don't we look at a histogram? Uh, so last class we, we looked at uh, histograms and the last, uh, the last lab we actually developed uh, so some histogram plots. Um, so you'll be familiar with the histogram uh, function within R. And here we're specifying the data set faithful and the eruptions metric. And as you can see, <clears throat> what it's doing is it's um, binning each of those values um, based on the eruption time in minutes and it's saying how many values that we have, so the frequency of values which falls into each one of those bins. So here when we didn't specify how large we wanted those uh, bins to be, uh, they've been put into 30 second buckets essentially. So you can see uh, between here, two, 2.5 minutes, three minutes, 3.5, four. And from this um, single histogram, you're able to see that the, the mode, uh, based on the way we've aggregated it here, uh, it is this value. So between four uh, and 4.5 minutes. However, if we actually then uh, specify the, the histogram and we uh, state that we want there to be 20 different buckets, um, then actually we get a different answer. So I'm using the word bin and bucket here interchangeably, but they just mean the same thing. It's just the level of aggregation in which you um, you, you you place those uh, those those values in order to represent the frequency. Um, but the the point of demonstrating uh, the difference between the more aggregated version here and then the the, the example with the twenty individual buckets. Uh, is that it shows you how changing the binning factor um, can actually affect um, uh, the result that you get. And this is why re, uh, reproducibility within science is such a huge issue right now, um, because many of these decisions we often make as we carry out a piece of analysis, and it's not always clear how those different decisions affect the outcome variable, and that's why we need more transparency around um, uh, the work that is published. So that's an improvement on just merely printing the variables to the console, as I've done here. But it's not exactly, it's not using R um, in the way, that, in the most powerful way possible, for example. So really, we want to be able to automate this process so that it tells us uh, exactly which the mode is. Um, so we have a, a function here. And the function is here basically to find which the most frequently occurring value is within the data that we have. Um, unfortunately, as I mentioned before, there isn't an inbuilt function for the mode, and therefore we have this um, rather clunky looking user defined function. Um, I am going to go into some detail at the end of this lecture about how we specify these user defined functions. Um, but for now, it's, it's easy enough just for us to demonstrate how this is able to produce the mode. So when we actually tabulate this data, and I'll show you what this function is doing shortly, um, it tells us that the mode, uh, it, it, there are actually two modes, 1.867 and uh, 4.5. And as this is a bit cryptic, why don't we pull out exactly what's um, being carried out within this function? So the main function is actually saying, OK, um, we're going to define a function. We're going to call it my mode. And we're going to say that this is uh, the input for the function, the data. And then we specify what we want it to do here. And basically, this creates a table. Uh, it vectorizes it out of the, uh, It creates a table out of uh, the vector data. And it counts how many occurrences there are of each value. And then this here essentially finds the maximum value so the, the one with the largest number of counts, um, which obviously is going to be the mode, and then returns it. Um, but as that's within a function, uh, I just wanted to demonstrate exactly what it's doing. So here, there we go. 
when we enter this line of code table as dot vector x what it's doing is saying how many times each one of these values is actually occurring um, so if we look through here there we go there's 4.5 and it's got eight occurrences and then actually if we go and look at the uh, the other value that was returned here 1.867 also has eight occurrences and that's why it produced a um, a result with two values, so it's a bimodal distribution essentially. Um, and then once we have that table, as we have here, um, what this is basically doing is say, get me the names of the values with the largest count. And when that returns, that's how we get these two values. So this function looks super complicated. Uh, but actually it's just doing a couple of uh, uh, very simple um, uh, steps. Um, it just looks complicated partly because it's in syntax form as well. But what's nice is then you have this reproducible object which you can continually use. Uh, you can test the function to make sure it's definitely doing what it should be doing. Um, and this is a really powerful way to write code. Um, then you don't have to repeat yourself at every step. I remember when I started first using R, um, probably about eight years ago now during my PhD and I would just copy and paste the code repeatedly. That was before I really worked out how to write functions um, and that means that as a consequence you only need to define a function once and then when you use it many many other times you just have to put in uh, the name of the function and enter the correct data and that means that it's then easier to just change small parts of your code without needing to change it in eight different places. So this is very powerful. So that's how you essentially um, import uh, 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 a data variable. Uh, you can sort it and inspect it manually on the console, or you can print it and understand uh, how the data looks based on a histogram, or you can automate uh, the selection of the most frequent value or values in this case. Um, and that's a, a nice way to, to get to the, uh, the automatic selection of this key metric that we're interested in. So as I mentioned in uh, the lecture, uh, I don't really use the mode very often um, and that's because uh, you kind of use it a lot when you're working uh, with uh, nominal data, so categories. Uh, so maybe if you were interviewing lots of people then you might use uh, this particular metric uh, quite often. But if you're working with uh, continuous numerical data, then you're probably much more likely to use uh, the mean or the median as a way to represent uh, the sort of central point of uh, your distribution. Okay, so talking of the median, um, what is that? Well, it's the uh, value that's in the very center of the distribution. So we, we went over this previously in the lecture. Um, and here we're going to show how we generate the median using both uh, a formulaic approach uh, and then finally also the built-in command. Um, so you're, you're in reality going to use the built-in command much more. But before you, you, you uh, move to that point, it's really important to know how to kind of do the basics of these calculations um, because that's a basic step. Um, uh, and, then, and then once you know how to do that, you can use basically the shortcut. Okay, um, so there is an issue with how you, you find the median. So if, um, uh, if you have an odd number of values in your data set, then it's quite easy to find the middle value. Um, but then if you have an even number of values in your data set, uh, then that's a little bit more challenging because you have to find the two middle values and, the, and then you have to get the average between them essentially. So let's look at our x variable that we imported before, so the number of so it's the minutes between eruptions, and there's 272 values. So this length here is just basically saying how many values there are within uh, the vector. It's the same in Excel if you're familiar with count, where you can count the number of cells or values over a specific uh, a range. Um, it is the same function essentially um, and um, what we're able to do 
is to uh, actually sort the uh, x variable as we showed before. So it's basically sorted all the way from the smallest value all the way up to the largest value. In reality, when you're calculating the median, it doesn't actually matter whether you're ranking it from um, the bottom to the top of the distribution as we're doing here or vice versa, because the middle value should be the same in all circumstances. So as the data set has an even number of observations, we need to find position one, which here we're doing by essentially dividing um, the length of the vector by two and then getting, we're indexing into x using that position indicator. And it provides us with the, the value four. So what does that mean? Well, let's just break that down a little bit so that you have a very clear understanding. So the length x divided by 2, well, there's uh, was it 272 values. Um, so when you divide it by 2, you get 136. Um, and then what we basically do when we go x, um, you remember before I showed you how to index into the variable. So if you look up here, uh, the first value is 1.6. So let's try put x1 there. There we go like that. And then when I print that, it's saying, get me the first value within that vector. OK, and we could press 2, which gets us the second value. And then we're basically when we put uh, this together, what this is doing is finding us um, that value in the distribution of values that's in the, the middle position, and that's why it's returning 4 here. OK, so now I hope you understand what this what we're doing here when we index. And that gives us the position 1. We then need to get position 2, so the second number, because obviously we've got an even number within this, uh, within this variable. So we then need to take an average between them. So it is 4 in both circumstances. Um, which means obviously when we take the average of that, uh, we're going to, to get four. Um, so this is um, basically how you would calculate the median if you wanted to do it in a pretty drawn out way, but then I'm able to show you incrementally how you would do it in fairly simple steps. You could just calculate it all in one line. So if you read Stack Exchange, this is called a one-liner. And um, R is not too bad for this, but Python particularly can get very complicated and you can do a lot of things in one line and it's nice if other people know kind of what you're doing in that line you can really simplify the code a lot but most of the time people may not know what all the different uh, uh, syntactic elements mean uh, and therefore you, you're probably better off being quite clear and doing it in simplistic steps personally i like it that way um, uh, and I think that it's easier for the code to be read if someone else is going to pick it up and try and use it. So that's two ways to basically calculate the median, but you could just use the built-in command. So when you do that, you basically um, use the median um, uh, function, you provide it with the data, and this here is basically, this, this character, uh, this uh, argument, is basically saying, can you ignore the values that aren't numbers? So, help median. There we go. So this is the help menu for the median function. And then when you go in, you can see that it states here as one of the arguments that na.rm is a logical value indicating whether na value should be stripped before the computation proceeds. So just imagine NA, NA values as values which are not numbers or which are missing values, um, and therefore you're telling the function to ignore them. OK, we'll come back to that at a later point in the, in the lecture. So let's move on to the arithmetic mean. So what we're doing here is generating a vector of integers between the stated range. So this is between 1 and 10. And then when you look at what's been created um, in the y variable in the global environment, you can see the numbers uh, between 1 and 10. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 
uh, and then we're able to get the length of, of the data set. So you'll remember that the, the sample um, uh, size is represented by lowercase n, and that's why we, we're using this uh, nomenclature here. So you can see now we've created um, uh, that, that single uh, sample size n um, variable, uh, which is 10. And we can calculate the mean in a very uh, long kind of roundabout way. So for example, we could take each one of the numbers and add them all up and then divide them by the, the length as we've done here. So it's 10. So we add all of these up and get 10. And the average that we produce is 5.5. So we can do that, uh, and that's a pretty convoluted way to, to, to get the answer. It's not really using the power of R, um, the, the power of um, actually using a programming syntax, but it's good for you to know how we, how we, uh, how we would do that uh, in the most basic way. Um, as an intermediate step, you're basically able to avoid writing all of this out by just saying, okay, give me the sum of Y. So you'll remember up here, when we created this Y variable, it appears over here in the global environment um, with all of the integers between 1 and 10. We could just sum that value. So if I run that, you'll see we get 55 down here on the console. And then if we were to divide that by the number of values in the vector, uh, we get 5.5. And here, this particular line carries out that uh, calculation. It then allocates it to the variable y mean 2, and then a semicolon denotes that you're then moving on to another uh, processing step, uh, and then here this just means, okay, now print it to the console. So that's how we end up with uh, uh, this particular value being produced. So that's an intermediate step. What's the quickest way? Well, the quickest way is just to use the built-in mean so let's see what that says. Help, that's not a word. There we go. Help, that's the arithmetic mean for the built-in um, base package. So it's generic function for the trimmed arithmetic mean. And you'll notice also that it has the ability to um, ignore those NA values, those not applicable values, uh, which we've done here as true. And when we run it, we get the same value. So we've been able to produce the 5.5 mean value in three different ways up here. OK, so that's handy to work out how to calculate the mean. But it does introduce um, a potential, potential bias if we have um, different categories and we only have maybe the averages for each of those categories and therefore if we just took the average of those numbers it doesn't represent how many maybe individuals or entities or data values are in each of those categories that have um, been used to generate that single average um, and that's why we use the weighted mean uh, so we we went over this within the previous lecture at quite a high level um, but now what I want to do is just kind of break down how we do how we would do those calculations and why we would do those calculations. So let's just ignore that because that's from a previous example which I, I didn't want to use. Um, so what I'm using here as an example is um, imagine that we have uh, three different income groups, okay? Income group one uh, has an average of $75,000 per year, and there's 100 people within it. Income group two has an average income of $150,000, and there's 10 people in it. And then income group three has an average of um, one million dollars and there's one person in that particular group. So you can see already that if we were to just take the the average uh, across the groups uh, we would probably end up with a, a skewed metric because it's heavily weighted by the fact it's heavily affected by the fact that some people earn a lot um, and um, that can skew the distribution upwards and it doesn't reflect the fact that maybe lots of people earn a lower salary um, as in this case where you have you know 100 people in the lowest bucket 
So let's produce two vectors which include those values. So you can see here income and the count. And um, we're able to then produce the, the, the uh, weighted um, uh, mean essentially by hand here. So what we're doing is we're, we're summing the income multiplied by the count and we're dividing it by the sum of the count. Um, so that's uh, 10 million, the income times by the count, and then the sum uh, is uh, 111. And then when we divide them together, we get a weighted mean of uh, $90,090, um, 0 0.9 cents as our weighted mean. That's the by hand version. There is an inbuilt function that allows us to do this. So here we're providing uh, the two different vectors and uh, this is just being calculated within R. So you can read up on the weighted arithmetic mean function if you would like. It computes the weighted mean and it allows you to specify uh, additional arguments such as the uh, ignore um, uh, non-applicable values. Uh, and then it's one thing for me to tell you that, that this might produce bias, but let's just quickly calculate what that bias would be. So if we took the mean of the income and just ignored all of the counts, then essentially uh, we would get an arithmetic mean for uh, that data set of uh, four hundred eight thousand dollars three hundred and thirty three um, point sorry four hundred eight thousand three hundred thirty three point three uh, dollars which is obviously far exceeding the weighted um, uh, average that we produced earlier so let's then calculate uh, what the difference would be so um, here what we're doing is taking the arithmetic mean from the weighted mean and we're taking the absolute value so this just removes the fact that if it's a negative value it just changes it to be positive and that means when we do this that the difference between the two values is um, 318,243.2 dollars income difference between the two different mean methods that we used and that's huge that's an absolutely astronomical amount so this is just an example of why it's important when you have very skewed distribution uh, to consider actually um, uh, weighting uh, your metrics um, especially if you, you've got that additional count information so that's the mean now let's consider missing data so I've talked about uh, these non-applicable, not available um, uh, values within the data frames uh, and the ability for us to basically instruct R to skip these missing values by using the na.rm equals true arguments. It's, it's just listed down here in the documentation for this function weighted arithmetic mean. Now let's play with some vectors where we've purposefully placed uh, an, uh, a not available uh, argument. So here, NANA um, is a vector which contains one to six values, and the one, two, three, fourth value is an NA value. Now, when we try to take the mean of all of these values, uh, the mean uh, returns uh, an NA argument. So basically, it, it, it errors, it's not able to uh, produce the mean value because not all the information is numeric and then it returns this non-numerical value. So if this is in your code and uh, you, you're, you're needing it to calculate a function within your model, then the model will just break and return an error, be a, a data type mismatch. So the beauty of using one of those pre-built functions, which allows you to um, uh, ignore uh, the not available values is that you can put na true to say, just take two, five, six, one, and six and ignore my na value and then that will produce four here as the mean for that individual vector. Uh, it's important to know that the length function does not recognize um, na value equals true. Um, you have to use na omit to get the length. Um, 
So if we if we just try the length function here, it, it errors. Um, it says that you've you've added too many arguments to that one particular function. Um, so if you look at length, there is no na uh, dot rm uh, arguments here, so you're not able to actually use it. Um, and that means that if you want to gain the length of the vector and you want to um, remove that na argument, then you need to use na omit. So na uh, ignore or na um, omit are diff different functions within R. So what this is basically saying is Sorry, here we go. So when you run na omit, uh, it, om it omits uh, the na value which I mentioned before, which then you're able to take the length of. And when you do that, it returns five because it's just counting these values here. Great. So that's dealing with missing data. It can be important. If you don't deal with missing data well, it can crash your model. Now let's focus on some measures of dispersion and variability. So we covered the range within the lecture. So the difference between the minimum value and the maximum value. Um, so why don't we clear this data here, um, load in the faithful data set as a data frame labeled all data. There we go. Uh, and um, Now let's extract x, which is basically the eruptions column from within our all data data frame. So that's the eruptions column, and we're extracting it here as x, as you can see. So it's uh, from uh, it's got up to 272 values. So this is the, the total number of values that we've got. And then let's find the minimum value. So min and max are inbuilt R functions, which are able to help you find the minima and the maximum uh, for uh, any uh, vector of data that you, you provide to it. So here it's basically emphasizing that 1.6 is the smallest value within that vector, and 5.1 is the largest value within that vector. So, how do we find the high and the low values? Um, uh, how, sorry, how do we then calculate the statistical range using these two different functions? Well, obviously, we just need to subtract the minimum value from the maximum value to obtain the range. And that's what we're getting here. So 3.5 is the variation between the bottom value and the top value. And this is a, a fairly uh, long-winded way to calculate it. I probably wouldn't do that in reality. I'd probably just use the inbuilt range function as we've shown here. And range returns the minimum and the maximum value. So let's just have a look. So we can go into the help menu and look at the function range of values. It returns a vector containing the minimum and the maximum uh, of all the given arguments. So you'll see that it's returning 1.6 and 5.1, so essentially the numbers that we, uh, we we produced earlier, but this time it just produces them in a, a single return call. Uh, and then we're able to calculate the range by um, indexing into um, that that uh, that that uh, into the returning variables and just selecting the ones that we want. So in position one, we have the minimum. And in position two, uh, we have the maximum. And then when we subtract uh, the minimum from the maximum, we get the value that we would expect for the range, so 3.5. And I just put this caveat down here because the range can be quite heavily affected by outliers within your data. So if we think of the income example, um, you know, the Bill Gates of the world, the Jeff Bezos of the world are going to be hugely affecting the range of, um, of, of, of the income distribution. And therefore, it, it can be quite badly uh, biased. And that's why we often consider using the interquartile range much more frequently, because it gives you, um, it's less sensitive to outliers. 
and it gives you a greater understanding of where the you know the large majority, so fifty percent of the values fall within that that inter quartile range. So from twenty five percent up to seventy five percent. So talking of quartiles and quartiles in, in that case, um, now we're going to look at how we actually uh, calculate uh, what the, the quantile range could be. Um, so quantiles, as we covered in the lecture, are um, essentially a way to partition your data into even um, numbers of observations. Um, so if we just took two quantiles, then it would be the median because that's the, the middle value. Uh, if we took four quantiles, um, so quartiles, um, then that would be partitioning the data into uh, the first 25%, uh, the second um, 25 to 50%, uh, the third uh, 50 to 75%, and then the final 75 to 100% of values across the distribution. So we're going to use the sequence function. So let's just have a look at what that does. So when you go over to the help menu, you can see that sequence generation shows up and it explains that essentially you're able to generate regular sequences by using a starting value and a finishing value. And you're also able to specify other values, perhaps an interval for how the sequence is generated. So firstly, just to start with the basics, uh, if we start at zero as a starting value and we go up to a finishing value of 30, then the sequence that it produces is literally from 0 up to 30. So nice and simple. Then if we add in that interval value which I mentioned, then we actually go from 0 up to 30 in steps of 10. So we go 0, 10, 20, 30, produces four values. And sequence also works in the opposite direction. So previously we've been going from um, uh, 0 um, in a positive scale up to higher numbers. We can go, in this case, from 30, a uh, positive number, um, down to 0 um, in the negative direction by specifying, um, for example, here, minus 5. So this is a step downwards uh, in, in, in 5 units at a time. So we go 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, 0. But the sequence is important because it allows us just to generate some data very easily. So a sequence of data points. Now we want to use the quantile function, but it does mean that we need to enter um, the boundaries, which I mentioned before, for the percent of uh, data values that we want um, to, to exist between um, certain thresholds. So just think of these as like the buckets that we covered before. You know, in the histogram, we have to decide how many values you want between uh, certain, certain numbers, so the size of those bars in the histogram. Um, so let's go here and see what this sequence does. And this is generating a sequence, a decimal sequence between 0 and 1 in 0 0.25 intervals. So it's providing us with 0, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and 1. Um, and then when we feed this into the quantile function, what this is doing is saying, um, please provide me with um, quartiles. So partition my data into uh, four individual um, uh, buckets or portions based on these uh, values that I provide here. And you can just think of these as um, percentages. So um, um, 0 to 25%, to 25% to 50%, 50% to 75%, 75% 75% to 100%. So then when we actually press this, you can see the value um, at the very bottom of the distribution. So 0, you can see the value um, whereby 25% of the distribution falls below it. 2.16275 and then you can see um, in this case the median value which is 4 and you can see the 75th um, uh, uh, let's just call it the percentile value 
um, or, or the quartile value. The, so the interquartile range is between the 25% and the 75% values. Um, and um, when you're at the 75th um, percent quartile, then the value is 4.45. And then we have the maximum value here, so 100%, um, 5.1. So you can interpret this as 100% of the values in the data set fall below uh, 5.1. Okay, great. Um, and then using this, this sequence uh, whereby we specify what kind of how, what percentage of values fall into the different buckets, um, we're also able to specify deciles, for example. So we spoke about deciles previously, it's how you split a distribution into 10 even buckets. So let's just look at the sequence that we're generating first. So it, this sequence is saying between the starting value zero and the maximum value one, please provide me with a sequence that steps in every 0.1 increment. So if you look, we go zero, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, so on and so forth, all the way up to one. Just as we did before, we just change the sequence of values that we place into the function. And then when we do that, it provides us with those decile values, and we're able to interpret this uh, in, in the same way that we did before. So we can do this using quintiles, so five buckets, or we can do it using percentiles, obviously that produces a lot of data. Um, I did speak in the previous lecture about how these, this type of um, thinking around probability and the distribution of data is used within the insurance industry. And actually, um, when we think of um, these, these, these uh, values that I'm producing here, so how do you partition your distribution into equal sets, um, you could be um, thinking of this in terms of how often values exceed those sizes. And this is how insurers would think about it. So how often does a hurricane, in terms of the amount of damage that it causes, um, exceed, let's just say, $10 billion, for example? And that matters because if you're an insurer, then you're, you're writing, um, you're writing uh, policies and people are paying you a premium for those policies. But if you get those calculations wrong, uh, then you'll be unable to pay people out when, when bad things happen, um, because obviously uh, the, the company would go under. Uh, and that's obviously not a good thing for anyone. Um, it's not a good thing for the company. It's also not a good thing for society when people have insured themselves against disaster uh, and then they aren't able to actually uh, get the, the, the money which they've originally paid for in return for the security. So this is uh, a very simple way to start thinking about um, how values fall into these different uh, categories. And you can think of that in probability terms and we will be thinking more about that in probability terms as we move towards the probability sections of the course. So we can get a summary just by using the inbuilt function. So summary, uh, if you want to read up about it in the help menu, provides you with the minimum value, uh, the first quartile, uh, the median value, um, the mean as well, the third quartile, and then the maximum value. So we calculate a lot of those by hand, but summary just gives you it uh, automatically. And then you're able to index into those returning values. So if you want the fourth value, then that would be the one, two, three, four, would be the mean value here, um, 3.487783. Um, and that might be a quicker way uh, to, to interrogate some of the underlying statistical characteristics of your data set in terms of um, descriptive statistics. So when you're, when you're quick and you know what you're doing in R, you can literally just import the data like that, and then you can just use some of these pre-built functions to, to give you all of the statistics really quickly. Uh, and it goes back to what I said before, which is that the likelihood here is that if you move into a job where you use these types of statistics, um, you'll probably spend 90% of your time actually generating the data, collecting the data. Um, it's called data munging or data processing, so getting it all into the right format and shape. And then about 10% of your time is spent actually doing the statistics, essentially. So let's have a look at a box plot.
So this is an inbuilt box plot function which takes the x variable um, and basically it shows uh, the distribution of that variable against the y-axis here, which is uh, minutes between different eruptions. And we can see that the whiskers uh, represent um, uh, the um, uh, the extremes of the values. Um, the interquartile range represents uh, the difference between the, the 25th and the 75th uh, percent, um, the percentile points. So here it's described as the first quartile and the third quartile. Um, and then in the middle here we have um, the median value. Okay, and you can see that um, generally more, more values must be spread in the upper part of this distribution here because the median value uh, is pretty high. It's quite close towards, there's not that much difference between uh, the top of the interquartile range and the, uh, the median value. So there must be fewer values in this bottom part of the graph. Uh, so I just put this comment here after the, after, after the lecture, which was, remember, <laughs> The middle black line is the median and not the mean, okay, in a box plot. Um, so I need to remind that, I need to remind myself of that sometimes. <laughs> um, so, so that's what I've demonstrated here. Great, so let's move on now and um, let's think about uh, some of those metrics which represent uh, variability in the data. So we did focus on the standard deviation uh, within the uh, within the lecture notes that we had, here we go. So we had the sample standard deviation, uh, which uses uh, the length of the sample, which is lowercase n, um, and um, uh, then, then that contrasts with the population standard deviation, where we have capital N representing the, the, the number of individuals in the population at large. Okay. So how do we actually calculate that? Well, um, I mentioned before with that uh, x bar, so this um, uh, this um, uh, character here represents, it's a mean value of x, so it's, it's the mean. Um, and that's why here we're calling this x bar, which we're putting into the, uh, uh, the, the global environment, so the actual value is 3.48, so we know that. Uh, and then to get little n here, what we need to do is we need to um, take the length of x, which we've done already, there's 272 values. And now we have basically all of the, um, uh, we have all of the uh, individual parts that we need to um, produce uh, the values uh, for the, the standard deviation. I do just want to add in one or two steps so that we can just specifically state what these are. So, when you actually add up all of the x values minus the mean and raise them to the power of two, this is actually called the sum of squares. So here what we're doing is we're, we're subtracting x bar from each individual uh, value that's in x and we're raising it to the power of 2. So the sum of squares here is 353 and I'm going to call it the sum of squares. And um, as it's a sample and it's potentially a small sample, we covered the, the idea that we had to use the number of degrees of freedom in the data set rather than the total values to avoid a, a biased estimate. So here what we do is we subtract one from uh, the total number of values in the data set to get the degrees of freedom. Okay, um, and then what we can do to get the standard deviation, we take the square root of the sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom which is 1.14. Okay, so I've calculated it here using intermediate steps so that you can kind of see what's going on. Um, but you can always use this one-liner. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and, and this is you know, perfectly acceptable if you know what you're calculating, but I just thought maybe I would separate it out for you so that you can see these individual steps. Um, and this reminds me actually, um, it's, it's not a bad thing to look at Simon Dadson's book. So I did mention previously about uh, his book, um, which is titled uh, Statistical Analysis of Geographic Data and Introduction. And the reason why I'm mentioning it is that uh, you, I was able to get the first few chapters, maybe I think four chapters, I was able to download them for free. Um, so I didn't know if you wanted to have a look at those. I personally think that his, uh, his explanation is actually probably better than what's in here. Um, so I think it's also useful to, to compare the explanation of the different ways that you produce the metrics between different texts. It just provides you with a different interpretation. Great. So that's how you calculate the standard deviation, uh, either using this more uh, convoluted approach or using this one-liner. As I mentioned before, you can always use uh, the uh, inbuilt standard function which here is called SD. So if you look at what uh, the function uh, says in the help menu, it's described as basically calculating the standard deviation of the values which are provided to it in X. And this function allows you to exclude uh, the, the not available values, just like the previous uh, functions that, that we looked at. So that's the standard deviation anyway, and it produces the, the metric S here. You'll, you'll remember S because it was the uh, it was the the it was the uh, variable that that calculation equaled over here. So I hope there's um, parity between what you see in the lecture slides and what you see in the R script. And now we move on. So now we're going to think of the variance. Um, so think of the variance as the square of the standard deviation. Here we go. So this is how we calculate the variance. Uh, we have the sum of squares here, and we have the number of degrees of freedom. And you can see that it's equal to um, the, the standard deviation squared, essentially. And that's because in the standard deviation, you take it back to the same units uh, as the original metric, uh, whereas here you don't. So um, one way to think about it uh, is as we've produced it here. So you're able to take the standard deviation and just square it. And the variation is uh, 1.3. Um, so the question is, well, why would we want to do this? Um, and uh, obviously the variance is important because it gives you an understanding of um, uh, the degree to which variables, uh, sorry, values are actually scattered around um, the, the, the central values. Um, and that's important because, I mean, in this case, it could be um, the return period, um, so the waiting time for the old faithful uh, uh, geezer. Uh, or it could be uh, the level of price volatility in a stock market. Um, that can either be that can be good or it can be bad, depending on uh, what you're specifically looking for in your investment strategy. Um, you know, volatile prices do allow you to make quite a bit of money, um, but also that could you could also lose it, lose it at the same time because there's so much of a, a swing, as opposed to maybe something that gives a fairly standard return and there's not much variation in that uh, in that price metric. So this is fairly simple in comparison if you just basically take the standard deviation and square it. But I just wanted to also put in you know, the basic calculation and just demonstrate that um, it's the same way as calculating the, the standard deviation. All we take here is the sum of squares and we take the number of degrees of freedom and we, we divide the sum of squares by the degrees of freedom, but we don't take the square root and that's why it, it stays um, as, as, a, as a squared value. And you can see there are these two different ways to calculate it here, um, but they both produce the, the same number, 1.3. And you can obviously use the built-in function, also producing the same number, 
Here we go. So the help is um, explaining that in this var function, uh, actually it's a set of functions, you could, you're, you're able to test the variance, the correlation, the covariance, depending on what you, you specifically want to do. So that's variation. Now let's just think about the coefficient of variation. I'm not sure that I was happy with how I explained it within the lecture, and that's why I just wanted to take a minute here to just kind of recap um, on this um, on this uh, variable. Um, so, so what's important is that the coefficient of variation is standardized. So that means that uh, you're very you're, you're able to then compare the level of variation between um, uh, metrics which have different means or medians, for example. Um, so, so they have a different distribution um, and you're also able to compare the level of variation uh, between different data sets that may be measured in different units and therefore it's, it's a powerful way to understand uh, that level of variability. Um, so generally if you have a low coefficient of variation that means that obviously there's less variation, well what does that mean? Um, the data are therefore more clustered around the mean and um, they're less dispersed away uh, towards the edges of the distribution. Um, and then if we have a high coefficient of variation, that means that there's a greater degree of variation around the mean. Um, and that means that um, uh, there's, there's more dispersion, essentially. So I just wanted to clear that up. Well, we can calculate that here. Um, so we know how to calculate the, the standard deviation. Uh, we know how to calculate uh, the mean value um, and then we're able to just um, basically divide the two and then multiply by, by 100 in order to get a percentage value. Um, so here we go, um, when we multiply it by 100 we then get 32, uh, approximately 32.7% uh, uh, variation. Um, and obviously that means that if you were to compare it with a data set that say had 50% variation, um, there would be lower variability uh, in this, in this um, uh, particular set of data uh, compared with the one that had the higher level of uh, variation, the higher coefficient of variation. And that's important because, um, uh, again, this could also represent uh, uh, the level of variation in precipitation between different places, uh, or it could represent um, variation between different stock options that you might want to pick. Okay, so we do have the ability to install packages within R, and uh, we did cover this previously when we installed the Tidyverse, and we played a little bit with ggplot2 in the first lecture of the class. Um, so I'm just going to recap on how you install and load uh, the particular package. Uh, in this instance, we're interested with the moments package. So let's just um, have a look here. Help moment. Oh, it's not an input function, so I don't think it liked me doing that. So let me just install the package here. So this is how we do it the first time round. That basically says go to uh, the, the CRAN website. This is an acronym, I can't remember what it stands for off the top of my head. Um, and then once you go there, please download uh, this particular data set. So, uh, and, and uh, so it's this particular package, that's what we've got here, a data package, uh, and it provides functions to calculate um, moments, um, uh, different levels of kurtosis or skewness within the data. CRAN stands for the Comprehensive R Archive Network, in case you were wondering. <laughs> You'll recognise this page because you might have downloaded R from here uh, when you when you were installing your R Studio as well. You may have downloaded a version of it here. Okay, great. Um, and then once you've installed that package, it will give you some red text, but uh, that's fine. Um, uh, uh, Sometimes it gives you red text, but it's it's actually still loaded. So I think I had a question uh, from from one of you at the Q and A session about that. 
and uh, it, I think it did install on your computer, but because it was red text, uh, someone was just like, oh, it's red, <laughs> there must be an error message. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that. It, it's just going through uh, a lot of installation procedures and um, it, it spits some of that out in, uh, in a scary color. Once we've installed that package once using this command, then we can just load it using the library feature as we do here. Great, and that, that loaded perfectly fine. So that's how you normally install uh, an R package, and that's going to become a lot more important as we move towards the end of the class because there aren't really uh, you know, the second half of the, the number of classes this semester. Um, there aren't really uh, many inbuilt packages in R that allow you to do inferential statistics, so to, to look at regressions, for example. And many of those uh, kind of more fancy statistical uh, applications and packages uh, are all built by people and not necessarily shipped with uh, the basic R package. Um, so it's a bit more specialized. So let's move on to the final part of this, uh, and that is um, the measures of, of shape and relative position. So um, what's the shape of um, uh, different uh, distributions that you have? Um, you'll remember that we have these different moments of a distribution. So um, the first moment is basically the mean value. Um, and then when we get the sum of squares, we're basically capturing the variance. Uh, when you raise those uh, th those uh, values to the power of three, you get the skewness. And when we um, carry out this equation here, where we raise those values to the power of four, then we're, we're obtaining the kurtosis. So let's let's do that. Um, so there's no inbuilt R function for skewness, so you'll have to use a, a formula. And we break that down into little pieces here. So. Uh, for the uh, the x vector, uh, which is on the um, the interval time for the geezer, we subtract the mean from each one of those values, and then we raise it to the power of three, uh, and then we uh, add up all of those values. So you can see here the residuals around the mean, and then when we when we sum these values, we get minus one six seven, which is the numerator for um, for this particular calculation. Here we go. So we did that first part of the calculation, the numerator just there. And then we need to calculate the denominator. So we need to take uh, the sample size and we need to take uh, s raised to the power of 3, so the standard deviation raised to the power of 3. And that's how we get the, the denominator for the calculation. Great. So now we've got the numerator and the denominator, and now we're able to actually calculate the skewness. So when we do that, we get the, the skew factor, essentially, which here is listed as uh, minus 0 0.41. So we've calculated that manually. Um, you could actually just use um, uh, this inbuilt uh, function from the moments package, which worked, thankfully, um, and produced the same number. Um, approximately the same number, it's slightly different. Um, that's interesting. Um, but uh, I think the key point here is, well, what's the interpretation? Um, and you'll remember if we go back to what we covered uh, skewness is basically reflecting uh, where the data lie um, when you look at the, the frequency of the values. So if you have a negatively skewed distribution, then uh, the data values move out towards the left. And if you have a positively skewed distribution, remember like our income distribution, um, then you have the tail moving really far out towards the right. There we go, there's the income distribution that you will remember with the large positive skew moving off to the edge of the, the, the page there, off to the edge of the graph. Okay, so how do we interpret this value? Um, well, there are specific statistical tests that will give you a formal indication as to whether the, 
the distribution is um, skewed to a certain extent, perhaps beyond what is normally expected at random. Um, generally, the interpretation which I'm providing you is that if it's you know if it's over one the skew, then it's highly positively skewed, and if it's um, below minus one, then it's highly negatively skewed. Um, so generally, um, this is within the realms of uh, of randomness, um, and uh, uh, as all we're doing in in this part of the uh, the class is just describing the data set. Uh, we're not taking this um, uh, any further to, to carry out any additional tests. We may uh, carry out additional tests in the second part of the, uh, uh, the, the class of this semester, and that's because the degree to which your data uh, may be normally distributed, for example, um, it is highly important for some of the tests that we carry out because you have assumptions about how the data is distributed and therefore you may want to carry out a formalized test which says yes we've tested this distribution and it, it, it conforms to meet that assumption essentially um, and, and that's that's sometimes a nice way to, to put in your paper that you know you thought about this and that you got this statistic um, uh, as a result and that indicates that the data are um, can be, be thought of as being pretty much randomly distributed, for example, and that justifies your use of the method. Okay, so um, that is the skewness. Now we're going to finish off uh, by thinking about um, the, the fourth moment, so um, kurtosis. Again, there's no inbuilt package for kurtosis, so we're going to use a formula. Um, it's the same formula as for skewness, just that we increase the power to four. So we get the numerator um, and we get the denominator um, and then we're able to divide one by the other to get 1.4 which basically means then in terms of the interpretation because you see here uh, it's over one uh, and uh, I'm interpreting this essentially as uh, in a similar way to the way that we interpreted the skew which is that if your values uh, are over one then it's highly peaked Remember, that's what we're looking for here, the, the shape of, of the curve of the data. Um, and then if it's um, uh, below minus one, then the distribution is very flat. So you remember that we, um, uh, we focused on um, that concept of um, platykurtic data, platykurtic, so flat, a flat distribution here. Um, uh, and I remember, I remember telling you that uh, the good way to remember that is that platypus is an animal which is very flat, and it shares the same it shares the same name for a reason because that's indicative of something being flat. Um, so as a consequence, that means that our data is actually um, leptoclertic, and that means that it's quite significantly peaked, as demonstrated here. And uh, you could just use the, uh, the specific uh, function from the moments package if you wanted to, uh, and that produces broadly the same figure uh, as what's uh, in, the, in the moments package. Okay, so functions. Um, why functions? I've already spoken about functions earlier in the class. From time to time, essentially, you'll want to create your own um, set of repeatable actions um, that you may want to use time and time again, and therefore avoids you having to write out, for example, each of these lines. Say you want to run it five or six times, you would have to write down the code each time that you want to run it. Whereas if you just have a, a single function then you're able to reduce that down to say five lines down to a single line each time you want to run it. <clears throat> so that's a huge reduction in the number of lines of code, it reduces the complexity that you have uh, within your code base um, and that's just generally uh, a lot easier to understand, it's easier to manage. Um, so I used to uh, just literally copy my code many, many times when I first started using R about eight years ago, early on in my PhD, because I didn't use functions. I didn't know what they were, and they just really scared me. <laughs> um, and therefore, as a consequence, uh, things got a lot cleaner when I moved to using functions. So you can just specify it once, then if you need to make a change to that function, you can just uh, 
make the change a single time and then all of the other times you call that function uh, it will always call the change that you made whereas if you write the code out each time then that's a massive amount of extra work you know if you, if you want to use it five times and you've written it out five times uh, then you'll have you know, five times the, the amount of work essentially um, just to make that one change that you want so we start by declaring the name of the function here function uh, sorry um, the name of the function is skew and then we basically say we're going to assign skew as a, a function so um, you can use an assignment operator either the arrow or an equals whichever one you want they both work and then we're going to tell our what well, we want to specify a function and we want to provide one argument that we feed into the, the function here and then we're going to go curly bracket the curly bracket just lets R know that um, what we're going to write next is the, the, the main functionality um, that needs to be run each time that we call the function. Um, so you can see here this is where they got so the calculation goes. Yeah, you don't have to indent, uh, but it does look better. Um, so if you keep it you know nicely formatted, um, but I'll just show you uh, uh, I put in here that the code just in case you want to cheat and that's um, to actually automatically format it. And this is really nice. Um, I only started using this recently, um, but if you just press Control Shift A, it basically does the automatic formatting for you. Um, so that's that's a really nice um, feature. So as I was saying, within the curly brackets, we have all of the different things that we want um, the uh, data that we pass to the function to do. So we're going to pass it a vector, uh, and then we're going to calculate this uh, numerator. Uh, from the vector, we're then going to calculate this denominator from the vector, and then we're going to calculate the skewness and return that number. Okay, so let's um, create the function by running the code over this, telling R that we want to create this function. And it adds it to the global environment here. It says that it's a function. This is the code that you ran if I click on it. And everything that we've defined within here uh, is internal to the function and can't be accessed um, outside of the function. So if I click NUMA uh, for this, this individual variable that we set up here, uh, it says that it's not actually found that, that variable. Finally, if I give our function uh, the the x data so if we call the function skew um, and we run it and we give it the the x column that we're interested in it's able to automatically calculate uh, the, the, the skew of the data for us so you can see how um, simple uh, these particular functions make our code base Okay, fantastic. Well, that's the end of the lab today. So we've we've covered quite a bit of ground. Um, so uh, we uh, focused on those measures of central tendency, uh, particularly single value uh, measures like uh, the mode, uh, the median, um, and the mean. Uh, we've then gone on to consider things like missing data, as well as measures of dispersion and variability. So that includes uh, the range values we've covered, uh, quantiles, um, how to create box plots, uh, understand the standard deviation, the variance and the coefficient of variation. And then finally we've uh, actually recapped on installing and loading uh, specific packages. Uh, and then actually we, we manually created different measures of shape um, such as skewness and kurtosis and we also uh, use that imported, imported package to use the inbuilt functions to generate uh, those particular metrics. So I think that that's a, that's a, a nice complement to be able to, to calculate them manually and then also um, to, to use the, uh, the packages that will save you time in the long run. <laughs> and then we finish just by going over exactly what functions are and a little bit about their structure. Okay, fantastic. Well, uh, this is the end of the third lab. Um, I'll be setting another assignment for you this week, focusing on the content that we've gone over. Um, please do uh, engage with me if you get stuck on the work. Make sure you do that in advance. I won't be very happy if you email me 
the day after the assignment is due saying that you're not able to do things that we were meant to be covering many weeks before um, so please please don't do that um, uh, get in touch with me uh, if you have any issues and I look forward to hearing you and, and good luck for the following week and uh, I'll, I'll see you all soon thank you goodbye